done. Let's dream yeah. for a second. Let's make some, I, some guesses at what may be happening in the future. And they're not pure guesses because they're scripture that gives us an indication of what God may be doing on the grand scale of things. Yes. You know, according to the Christian perception of the universe that began centuries ago, the cosmos didn't need to be as big as it is. Something maybe a little larger than the solar system, maybe 10,000 stars, would have been enough for what to show Christians the have understood God. to be God's purpose. Now we find out there are hundreds of billions of galaxies, each one with 100 billion or more stars and all the globular clusters orbiting around them, each one with 10,000 to 50,000 stars. It's enormous. And yet we haven't tried to expand our uh, theology in relation to this in greatly enhanced understanding of the vastness of creation. So I think we need to do some thinking about this. There should be elements of our understanding of scripture that relate to this enormous size of the universe, which indicates a very big plan of God that's underway. So we're re-examining the scriptures in light of new knowledge. Yes. And here is a scripture that I think bears upon that issue. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, the apostle Paul wrote that God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, not just the wisdom of God, because Satan knew that, but now the manifold wisdom of God, which is more than what the angels originally knew. Fall, redemption. The whole plan of redemption. Things that the angels didn't know when they rebelled is now comprises the manifold wisdom of God. God's intent was that now through the church, and the church has firsthand experience, of the manifold wisdom of God, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Rulers and authorities are defined by what? What would be a ruler or authority? So what this means is there are finite beings out there in the heavenlies, and couldn't we say it would be on other planets? You know, it's only in the last few years that astronomers looking out, examining stars, are discovering other stars have planets orbiting around them. They've even found some stars that have more than one planet orbiting around them. And even though from our own solar system we'd see only one planet is really habitable, there are other planets, no doubt in other solar systems, that would be as habitable as this one, perhaps even more so, and with the scale of the universe, astronomers are now estimating there may be millions of worlds that are habitable. Well, let's just hypothesize here. Let's just dream. I know Christians are not accustomed to thinking in this way, but I think we've got to bring ourselves into this field of thought because this is the reality of what science is encountering. And don't we, should we have nothing to say about it? Suppose that when Paul spoke about rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, he was talking about future progenitors of new races on faraway worlds. And God's intent is that they should be filled with worshipers of him. But because of the phenomenon of free will, if God just goes ahead and fills those planets with uh, finite beings possessed with free will, what will eventually happen somewhere, sometime, another Oh. exercise of the negative side of free will. In order to guarantee that no matter how many worlds out there, God uh, seeds with new races, new groups of worshipers for him, that they will be there and never fall. God has ordained this manifold wisdom of God. And through the church, he's going to present it to the people that he creates out there with the idea that when the church as God's storytelling mechanism explains the manifold wisdom of God, it will so impress those yet to be created beings that they will learn about how awful evil was in its all out manifestation in this world. They will understand the glory of God in his love providing redemption for sinners, rebels like us. 
And here we will be to tell the story of that awful fall and that great redemption to people in other worlds for what purpose? So that they, hearing the story of this world, will make sure, will guarantee that's not going to happen where they live. So our story, of our telling of the manifold wisdom of God will, will be sufficient to guarantee that no matter how many worlds God fills with, no matter how many future races of finite beings, there will never be a repetition of the fall that happened here. We will be God's means of galvanizing enormous numbers of finite moral beings from ever repeating the fall. God will have as a result enormous numbers of worshipers offering free will love to him forever and ever. Now, someone might say, if they're not listening carefully, this sounds like Mormonism. Mm. What's the difference? Mormonism means that women who have the Mormon faith are going to physically be transported to other planets and bear children throughout eternity, have an eternity spent bearing child after child after child in order to people other worlds. So Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, was taking a step in the direction of somehow linking the religious experience here in this planet to worlds out there. But that's a rather different thing. And by the way, I've heard of Mormon women who were not exactly interested in spending <laughs> an eternity uh, childbearing. And there have even been some who have committed suicide in order to disqualify themselves from that kind of a privilege. Mm. So we're not talking about the storytellers bearing children. No. All we're talking about are the storytellers giving a witness, yes. a testimony of the goodness, the grace, and the manifold wisdom of God, very different from Mormonism. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's go to our second verse, <clears throat> Matthew yes. chapter 13, verse, verse 44. 44. Jesus gave this rather mysterious parable and didn't go into detail to explain it, which means we're supposed to grapple with it ourselves and see if we can understand it. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. What is the treasure? What is the field? Read on. When a man found it, found that treasure buried in a field, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went out and sold all he had and bought that field. Why? in order to get the treasure that he knew was buried in the field. And you might say, well, if he found the treasure. Why didn't he just say finders keepers? Take it, not sell everything he had to get the field. The implication is here, that would have been stealing. It would have been an illegal acquisition of the treasure. But when he sells all he has and buys the field, he not only owns the field, he legally owns everything in it. So what is the field? I propose the field is creation. And what is the treasure hidden in the field? The very thing we've been talking about. God saw the potential to have enormous numbers of free will agents brought to a situation, a level of spiritual maturity and understanding of truth wherein they would worship him, they would Everyone know they have the potential not to worship him, but would choose to exercise that potential positively. And he would have all those worshipers as his community, his great kingdom forever and ever. That's the treasure buried in the field of creation. And so what he sold? So he sold his privilege of remaining isolated just by himself throughout eternity. The perfect and, trinity. Yes. The perfect trinity alone. The that members of the Trinity were quite happy just by themselves. There's really, they didn't technically need to have millions of worshipers, but it was their choice. They want us. Because they have free choice. They have free choice, and that's their free choice. So here we are. We're swept up in the fulfillment of their free choice made ages ago, of course. So this treasure hidden in the field is what we've been talking about, God arranging to have enormous numbers of worshipers worshiping him. And he had to allow a, an abuse of free will to happen initially in order to create a brand new, far grander, far more persuasive context which people created. And facing that, those persuasions would be so charmed 
and so filled with awe that they would choose not to violate the gift of free will. I think this is so key because if there isn't free will, if God cannot be loved gen by genuinely free will beings, he wouldn't go to the trouble to create not even one electron. This is what he really wants. This mm -hmm. is what is implied. The love, God who is love wants this. Next passage, Ephesians <coughs> chapter 2, mm -hmm. verses 6 and 7. This also implies a cosmic purpose for those us finite little beings redeemed from this world. God raised us up, Paul declared, with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Show to whom? Not to us. We already know it. Right. We're part of the story. Show to those people. Those people mentioned in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. I mean, it sure makes sense to me. In the coming ages, not in this age. Yes. It's the future unfolding of God's great cosmic purpose. The uncomparable <laughs> riches of His grace. That's mm -hmm. the redemption plan. Mm -hmm. That's what the story that we have to tell. And He's showing it. Who's He showing it to? In the coming ages, to it's all going to those be people new races. that don't already know it, and it's going to be shown to them, and it's going to be shown to them to influence them, to impact them in a certain profound way. Now I think we can begin to understand as Christians why the universe is as big as it is, and how what's happening in this world relates to what is going to happen throughout this vast universe. Okay, Don, you oh, got one more to go. I got another one to go. All right, we'll add another one. <laughs> Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. <clears throat> this also hints at a cosmic purpose for those of us redeemed out of this world. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, Daniel wrote, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So the purpose of leading people to righteousness. Forever and ever. Yes. Key words. They'll shine like the stars forever and ever. But we will lead many to righteousness. Now, people may say that only refers to people being led to righteousness in this world. Hmm. All right. If that's, they want to limit it to that, that's fine. But they can't deny it's possible in the light of these other scriptures that it's leading many to righteousness preemptively by telling the story of redemption in such a way that people who might become unrighteous will not. And the key words forever and ever, <clears throat> only in this world does not forever and ever. It's a finite point yes, in time, this age. Except that it says they'll shine like the stars forever and ever. But, two ways uh, you could interpret that. Two ways that. you could interpret that. Don, we've used the words hints, mm -hmm. propose, yes. dream, mm -hmm. We've got this possible dream of what God may be doing forever and ever and ever, us being storytellers. What are we held accountable for here on this earth now that we still have our however many years to live, 70, 80 years on this earth? <clears throat> we should realize what God's purpose is. He wants to redeem as many as possible, ASAP, from this planet. And he's granted us the privilege, I call it the bless or franchise, to seek being blessed by God ourselves, being redeemed, being justified by faith, being regenerated by the Holy Spirit. We're left in this world not just to bide our time, but to serve our God by spreading the knowledge of the gospel, proclaiming Jesus, and persuading people to turn to Him. And the Holy Spirit waits to uh, anoint our efforts to reach out with the gospel. So God has prepared us, given us a spiritual empowering. So let's make use of it. And let's do whatever we can, directly or indirectly, to contribute to the crossing of every frontier, sending messengers where messengers have not been sent, so that some, at least some, but hopefully many, from every language, nation, people, and tribe will be brought in, brought to faith in Jesus, and will share with us these eternal joys and glories So the greater glory of God. Keeping witness as a priority, keeping our, our love for God as a priority, and keeping <clears throat> a priority the unreached peoples of the world yes. 
uh, and keeping a focus on them that we might speed the return of our Lord Jesus here yes. on this earth. So we can dream, but at the same time, we've got to keep our feet on the ground mm -hmm. and do what the Lord has commanded us yes. to do, called yes. us to do, yes. to reach all nations. Don, we've had a phenomenal time asking the question, who wins in the end? Yes. Does God win the moral victory, but not the quantitative victory? In other words, the qualitative <laughs> versus the quantitative. Is heaven being more populated than hell? Or is hell being more populated than heaven? Yes. We've come to a conclusion. We believe, go ahead. God wins the victory in both counts. In both counts. He's won the moral victory over the evil one at Calvary. He's winning the quantitative victory over him by utilizing the witness of general revelation plus the witness of special revelation wherever possible, plus the unsuspected mercy of high infant mortality rates in many places during many times of history to fill heaven with far more people than will have been lost. All of this largely based on two things. Number one, the number of people who have died under that age yes. far outnumber those that are coming to know the Lord. Yes. And historically, you were finding out 66% somewhere oh. around there right off the bat. <clears throat> yes. That puts us out there. So as, whereas most Christian teachers just ignore infant mortality rates, you just don't find any mention of them. And the theologians in the early days who were wrestling with anything along this had no idea. They didn't know about these things, nor did they know about the vastness of the cosmos. So we're just endeavoring to suggest ways that these major factors of uh, in high infant mortality rates down through history, linked with the question of heaven, what's the, what are the percentages going to be? We suspect heaven will have far more than 50% of mankind, maybe two thirds, who knows? I'm eager to find out. And how this relates to the, the cosmic purpose that Paul is specifying in, in especially in Ephesians chapter okay. 3, verse 10. Now, I want to be clear on what we are not doing. Yes. We are not putting percentages with these. We, we've made some guesses. They could be totally wrong. Mm -hmm. The majority, yes. yes. The percentages, we have no idea. Uh, with these are best guesses. We're not sure. It could be higher than 77. Yeah. could be lower than 77. But we're, we want to say very firmly, it's certainly greater than 50. In order to have really accurate percentages, you have to be able to go back before history began even to count the number of people that died or that they existed lived. and whether they were Christian or believed in an uncreated creator or whomever. And that's just not possible. Not possible. But we have certain parameters and that's what we're limiting ourselves to. What do you think this does to people when they say, wow, <clears throat> we really do win in the end? Mm -hmm. What do you think it's doing to their, to their soul? I'll, I'll tell you the one thing it does to my soul. Let's hear that first. It, puts me in awe of God and makes me want to worship him mm -hmm. so much more yes. and become so close with a God who's in control, yes. not only of the moral victory, mm -hmm. but the quantitative victory. That's a God I can worship. That's a God I can give my life to and say, mm -hmm. I want to be not only used for your purposes, I just want to know you. Yes. I want to know your glory and be close to you. And you be used for your purposes. And be used for your purposes, Both. absolutely. It makes me want to echo the words of the hymn writer. There's a wideness in God's mercy. God's mercy is wide. His net mm. reaches very wide and draws. Wider than most of us probably will ever think or know. Yes. And <clears throat> if this is accepted by more and more Christians and taught more widely, Many unbelievers who have had a very caustic, negative attitude about Christianity as teaching that a God is content to perhaps save three or four percent of mankind and let the rest be lost forever will recognize that it really isn't that way. God may have been represented by his people in this world as being that kind of a God, but actually he's a much bigger, much more uh, wise and merciful God than has been represented at many times and places. And for those who do know the Lord, I think it's going to give them a greater confidence in the wisdom of God yes. and in their Christianity, mm -hmm. that they're going to be able to go out with greater confidence and say, this is my God. Let's worship him together. 
And the God who calls me is not going to leave me shortchanged, lacking help when I get out there, the place where he wants me to serve him. I'll have his gift of wisdom. I'll have his enabling. And he will help me to see the fruit that will glorify him. In a very, I don't know, big or small scale, I'm not sure which, but possibly parents or women who have lost children in miscarriage, if, yes. they've, if they've been taught from you know, the womb to the tomb, they're going to hell, and now they realize, my child's going to be in heaven. Yes. They're going to want to say. There might be unbelievers who have lost children they dearly love. And to be assured, that child that you loved, you brought into the world, guess where that child is? Up there with Jesus and with God. That unbeliever might say, well, from this I moment I love that on, child so much. I want to be with my child. And of course, they get to be in all in with the child, but with God and the whole host of the redeemed. Don, these outcomes are very real and very true, but there's probably a host of other outcomes we can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. As non-Christians and Christians begin to see the glory of God in not only winning the moral victory, but the quantitative victory. Yes. What that could do the, to the number of non-Christians who come into the kingdom mm -hmm. and what it could do to the number of believers to worship God in a fresh new way. And feel encouraged to spread the gospel everywhere in the world. Absolutely with that confidence. That's our goal. That's our desire. That's our prayer. And so we hope that you will be a part of this as you experience it, that you're going to go around and teach it uh, as we have seen it, as we've taught it to others, electrify their lives. This has been a s focus found in deep, a series with Don Richardson. In our next time, Don, we are going to be amending the, the Apostles, Apostles Creed. Creed. Yes. And trying to see something that was missing that has affected the church. Through for much of its history. Much of its history. I hope you can get there too. Thank you. Yes.